lesson, and I want to take a look at the life of Moses uh, in Exodus chapter 3 and uh, part of uh, Exodus 4. But before we do that, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for being with us. We ask that you would bless this time. And Father, that you would continue to grow us. And Father, we pray that uh, the words that I speak will be your words. And Father, it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. When you think of Moses, what mental picture comes to mind? For me, it's Charlton Heston. Exactly. It's Charlton Heston being in God's presence, receiving the Ten Commandments, leading the children of Israel to the Promised Land, parting the Red Sea. Moses is one of the most prominent figures of the Old Testament. But what you have to know is the image that we have of Moses is the Moses that God worked on, and that's the man that Moses became. The Moses that I want to look at tonight is a different Moses, same Moses, but he has a different character at this time. Um, The Moses that that comes to our mind that has done all those wonderful things, this Moses that we're going to look at He's Moses, the excuse maker. Now, I have to say, and you might agree once we get into the message, he was a pretty good excuse maker. But God, the good news is, God was a much better at convincing Moses to become the leader of his people. Most commentators break Moses' life into three 40-year periods. First 40 is from his youth to when he fled Egypt. The second 40 is his mid-age, and he becomes a humble shepherd. And the third 40, and this is where we're going to be looking at, this is, this is Moses' calling. This is when Moses uh, is called from the burning bush. So <clears throat> we're going to be reading... From Exodus 3, probably we'll read the first three verses. So this is Exodus 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of sheep, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, for the, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Verse 3, then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. The bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. It wasn't just that Moses saw a burning bush. Two things were very distinctive about that bush. The angel of the Lord appeared from the midst of that bush. And though the bush burned, the bush was not consumed. Verses 4 through 6. When, so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Verse 5. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, verse 6, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. When the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to look, God didn't speak to Moses until he got Moses' attention. Oftentimes, God's word doesn't really penetrate our hearts because we're such busy people. Oftentimes, we really don't give attention to God's word. 
God called to him from the midst of the bush. Moses didn't see anyone in the burning bush, yet God, in the presence of the angel of the Lord, was there, calling out to Moses from the midst of the burning bush. Moses, Moses. God's first words to Moses called him by name. This shows that even though Moses was, not, was now an obscure, humble shepherd on the backside of the desert, God knew who he was, and Moses was important to God. The double call, Moses, Moses, implied importance and urgency. Then he said, God told Moses to do two things, to show special honor to this place because of the immediate presence of God and do not draw near. Also, he told Moses, take off your sandal, take the sandals off your feet. Removing the sandals showed humility. The poorest and the most needy had no shoes and servants usually went barefoot. It also recognized the immediate presence of God. This was a holy place. God wanted to let Moses that he is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He reminded Moses that God is the God of the same covenant. This wasn't a new God. This is the same God that the patriarchs knew. In verses 7 through 10, God's going to explain his general plan to Moses and Moses' part in that plan. In verse 7, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, verse 8. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Parasites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, verse 9. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppose them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, and you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. A little history of Moses. Moses tried, when he was a youth, living as a prince, and when he decided that he was going to give up being a prince and he was going to take the side of the Hebrews, he tried to protect one of his fellow brothers. And that's when he killed the Egyptian. And that's when he had to flee. So Moses should be chomping at the bit as he heard what Moses was, what God was proposing. God wanted to deliver the Egyptians from bondage. They wanted to bring them into the new land. He heard their cries. So Moses should have been, yeah, sign me up. But this is where the conversation between God and Moses go back and forth. Moses, God is trying to reason with Moses and give him reasons why he should take part and become part of the leadership that he's called him to be. And Moses is giving God excuses. And this starts in Exodus uh, 3.11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Who am I, he says. He's telling God that he feels inadequate. He feels like he's not the man of the job. And, and there may be some truth to that. Moses, again, once being from the ruling house of Egypt, now just being a lowly shepherd, 40 years had passed 
since he was in Egypt. He's 80 years old now. You know, not a lot of people take on a new ministry at 80 years old. But Moses is 80 years old this time. So God quickly responded to Moses being inadequate. In verse 12, God says, So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. I will certainly be with, I will certainly be with you. God tells Moses, and that alone should have been sufficient. I mean, we learn, I mean, Paul tells us in, in Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Moses, again, has ample information from God to accept God's challenge. But we see in verse 13, this is Moses' second excuse. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? What shall I say to them? Moses knew that the elders that he was going to were going to have some questions for him, such as, Who's the God that sent you, possibly? Or, you want us to leave? We're comfortable here. We've been here for 40 years. You know, sometimes even when people are in bondage, they're comfortable. They want, they want to be there. They don't want to leave. Moses understood some of these things. And so Moses expresses inadequacy in knowing what to say. And God is right there. Look at verse 14. And God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial to all generations. So Moses doesn't think he has enough knowledge. He doesn't know what to say. He doesn't know who to tell the leaders what God. And God tells him that he is the I am. And, you know, I looked up. I thought it was odd. I mean, I know the story. We all know the story. I am who I am, but it seems a little odd to, to uh, refer to yourself as something such as that. And uh, I just did a little look up on God's name, I am. It's from a Hebrew, a Hebrew verb, uh, to be or to exist. Uh, God was declaring to Moses he was self-existent, he was eternal, he was self-sufficient, so... God had no equals, equals. So when he said, I am who I am, they would have understood that. But if they didn't, they would have understood that he is the God of their forefathers. Their forefathers knew who God was. So in verse 16 through 20, God tells Moses, God tells Moses to go to the leaders. And he tells uh, Moses how things are going to play out. So, verse 16, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. 17, And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Par Parasites and the Hivites and the Jebusites to a land flowing with milk and honey. Those Parasite P 
people must have got a lot of, they must have got a lot of flack. I'm sure I'm saying that incorrectly, but verse 18, this is a key, this is a key verse to, to remember. Verse 18, then they will hear, then they will heed your voice, and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to them, the Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey in the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I'm sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not even by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, he will let you go. Verse 21, and I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be. When you go, that you shall not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near the house, articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. God had a plan, and he's expressed it to Moses. He's given, uh, so far, Moses has had a few excuses, and God, I believe, has given, has given him enough information to say, yeah, God, I'm your guy. But I said earlier, Moses is a pretty good excuse maker. Look at verse 4-1. Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. Suppose they, won't, they will not believe me. Now that he knows Moses, now that he knows what to say, he balks at the idea that the people will listen to him. Has he forgotten that God will be with him? God responds by, equip, by equipping him with several convincing proofs. And this is God's response, starting in verse 4. So the Lord said to him, What is it? What is that in your hand? He said, A rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God, their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Furthermore... The Lord said to him, Now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, and then he took it out. Behold, his hand was leprous, like snow. And he, and he said, Put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom, and behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river and pour it on the ground, on the dry land, the water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. So, God is equipping Moses, giving Moses more and more information that Moses will come around and listen to what it is that God wants Moses to do. God's telling Moses the rod is going to turn the rod into a, to the serpent. His hands are going to turn into leprosy. The water with which uh, the water will turn to blood when it's dropped on the ground. I mean, these are, these are major, major 
signs. And oftentimes, signs are the things that turn people to the Lord. So God is giving Moses all the ammunition that God thinks Moses needs. And Moses answers God in verse 14. Then Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow to speak and slow of tongue. Moses claimed that he's not an elo eloquent speaker. God already knew his abilities. God called him. God's able to make up for any of our shortcomings. And again, God promises, we'll see in verse 12, to be with Moses. God's response for, for this fourth excuse. Starting in verse 11. So the Lord said to him, <clears throat> So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute and the deaf, the seen or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be your mouth, and I will teach you. So, you have to understand there's a difference, and I think we all know that, there's a difference between excuses and there's a difference between excuses and reasons. So Moses at this time has given God four excuses. And God has given Moses four reasons why he should listen to what God's to God's call. And <clears throat> verse 13. But Moses' response to the slow of speech, O Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. Please send whomever else you may send. What does that sound like to you? God, send somebody else. So the real reason that all the previous excuses was really a smokescreen. It was a simple fact to hide what Moses was feeling. When, when Moses was using the excuses, God responded by, I'll help you here. I'll be here. I'll give you the words. I'll be with you. But listen to God's response at verse 14. God responds. <clears throat> so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well, and look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you that you shall uh, what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. I have to say, there's probably not one of those excuses or reasons that I haven't used. Not really proud of it, but um, I've used them. I've used them recently. Um, so I truly was encouraged by the conversation that Moses and God had. And I think we're all really well accustomed of, 
our God being a God of second chances. And so it's, it was encouraging to me that God stayed with Moses, even though, I mean, his excuses might have been considered a lie, um, but God knew who he had in Moses. So um, God never gave up on Moses. And I think to me, that's what's encouraging. I mean, and I think that should be encouraging for, for all of us because we're, we're, we don't always, um, we're not always the first one to step out there and say, when we're asked, I'll do that. Sometimes we're the person that's standing in the back, you know, waiting for that person to say, I'm that guy. Or you see the old military cartoons when they're looking for, when there's a line of guys there and they're looking, the sergeant's looking for a volunteer and everyone steps back except one guy and it looks like he's the guy that, that volunteered. So, well, probably going to get out a little early. With Moses, we know the rest of the story. He answered God's call. He went to Egypt. With the help of God, he delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. So the Moses that we had a picture of is true. But Moses fulfilled what it was that God wanted him to do. But what about us? What will be the rest of the story for us? Will we be an excuse maker? Or will we answer God's call? Really, only time will tell. But I pray that we answer God's call. Amen? Amen. Is there another song or? No? Okay. Okay. What's that? We're done. Well, I'm done as well. So I guess we should pray. Thank you, Father in heaven, for who you are and for all you do in all our lives. Continue to grow us and mold us into the image of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Everyone have a Merry Christmas. Thanks for putting up with me.